So I'm extremely pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today. I want to acknowledge the fact that I'm participating today from the traditional land of the Kenyan Keaka Mohawk Nation. Uh, when I present, I usually uh, move around. Uh, when there's an audience, I move around uh, and also ask questions to keep your attention. But today we'll have to juggle with uh, videos and animation to have uh, some variation. I would also ask uh, you to uh, express with a show of hand how many you know of the role of space in agriculture. Uh, since I can't see your hands, I'll have to assume that most of you would raise your hand and think about precision agriculture and hence the position, positioning, navigation, and timing capabilities, better known as GPS positioning system. Well, today I will tell you about a few space missions and the strength of combining data, but also of this reciprocal relationship between agriculture and rocket science. Let's start with a reminder of last year's presentation. Satellites became reality because of rocket science, but today satellites can help agriculture in seven ways so far. Satellites have been doing their share from space by providing key data to help monitor the growth and harvesting of crops. Satellite data combined with smart farm equipment and weather models allows farmers to use less water, fuel, pesticides, and fertilizer. This enables them to produce healthier food more efficiently and more sustainably. A study of the benefits a couple of years back indicated savings close to $600 million per year due to this use of satellite data. The canola industry, for example, used satellite imagery to demonstrate regulatory compliance to gain access to a market that is worth 100 to $200 million per year in the European Union. Satellite supports agriculture by monitoring growth, assessing soil and crop health, better forecast of precipitation, assessing soil moisture, avoid waste of fertilizer, pesticide water, as I said, and maximizing crop yields and facilitating sustainable management. I have to tell you that space is relatively expensive and we find strength in collaborating with other space agencies. We also participate in international organizations in order to first better inform our decisions, but also to coordinate our efforts and contribute to global challenges. Yes, I am the Director General for Space Utilization at the Canadian Space Agency, but I am also, with a colleague from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, a Principal Representative of Canada on the Group on Earth Observation. I'm also the Head of Delegation on the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. And a colleague from the Canadian Space Agency represents Canada at the European Space Agency Council. These three organizations bring forward a capability for us to influence, but also benefit from a greater community. GEO, or the Group on Earth Observation, for example, will advocate the value of Earth observations, engage communities, and deliver data and information in support of food security and sustainable agriculture, one of their uh, main interests. So GEO is looking at more than just space. It's also looking at uh, ground observation, uh, traditional uh, knowledge as well. And they bring this all together. They have a subgroup that's called GEOGLAM. You might have heard of that. It's the Group on Earth Observation Global Agricultural Monitoring Initiative. And the purpose of that group is to increase market transparency and improve food security by producing and disseminating relevant, timely, and actionable information on agricultural conditions and outlooks of production at national, regional, and global scales. CIOS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite, um, we consider ourselves a little bit like the space arm of GEO, because when GEO 
uh, thinks about a challenge that they have, for example, uh, the global uh, stock take on carbon, the climate change action. Well, we look at the goals that GEO sets and how can space help contribute to addressing this. CIOS is 63 agencies operating more than 200 satellites. Its mission is to ensure international coordination of civil space-based Earth observation programs and promotes exchange of data to optimize societal benefits and inform decision-making for securing a prosperous and sustainable future for all of humankind. ESA is the European Space Agency. It comprises 22 member states, all from Europe, but Canada has a, a seat at the council table at, under a cooperation agreement. So we're the only non-European uh, country to be at the table, and we do benefit from this partnership on different levels and different programs. Now, as promised, I will touch on a few of the tools that were made possible by different partnerships. These tools collect useful data that becomes the raw material for actionable, actionable products, information products. This is the Grace and Grace follow-on mission. You have an artist rendition there, credit of NASA G GPL Caltech. But the vast, the, the, the purpose of this mission was to look at gravity. Uh, the vast majority of Earth's gravitational pull is due to the mass of the Earth's interior. A small part, however, is due to the mass of water on or near Earth's surface. The oceans, rivers, glaciers, and underground water change much more rapidly than the Earth's interior does. Responding to changing seasons, storms, droughts, and other weather and climate effects. GRACE grew from the recognition that a speci specially designed mission could observe these changes in water from space, revealing, hopefully, hidden secrets of the water cycle. I was talking about underground water. This slide here, and I'm not expecting you to read the legend uh, at the bottom, uh, depending on the size of the screen you're looking this, you're listening to this presentation. But the vast, basically the underground water is stored in soil and aquifers below the Earth's surface. It's very sparsely measured worldwide. No one guessed before launch that GRACE would reveal unknown groundwater depletion. But over the last decades, uh, researchers have found more and more locations where humans are pumping out groundwater faster than it is replenished. In 2015, their team published a comprehensive survey showing that a third of the Earth's largest groundwater basins are being rapidly depleted. And when we say rapidly depleting, I'm going to give you a number, 11 trillion gallons. That's the amount of water that NASA scientists say would be needed to replenish key California river basins and what they're calling the first ever estimate of the water necessary to end an episode of drought. 11 trillion gallons. The problem is we're, going fat, we're pumping it faster than it's being replenished. Let me start this animation, which looks, <coughs> sorry, which looks at water, underground water, basically, with the GRACE mission. So you have from 2005 to 2014, I believe, or 15, uh, the animation stops. But it's the evolution through the dates, through the time of the underground water in different areas. Of course, red is bad, green is good. Um, you see this evolving over the planet. One thing I'd like to, to say as well is that GRACE also measures sea level uh, in, in, in a different way. It's 
sea level is rising both because of melting ice from land uh, is flowing into the ocean because seawater is expanding as it warms as well. So there's two uh, components to an increase in sea level. But scientists have a very precise continuous measurement of sea level heights worldwide beginning in 1992. Uh, with different missions and continuing, uh, there, there were uh, a number of uh, missions that gave these uh, measurements. But altimeter measurements, which is the tool that, uh, that is used to determine the height, uh, they only see the full effect, as I was mentioning, from all the causes. So to get an in-depth view of the process responsible for the changes, scientists need to know how much the full effect is due to each component or source. With GRACE, scientists are able to distinguish between changes in water mass and changes in ocean temperatures. An example of the value of this ability uh, is a study a few years back led by uh, GRACE project scientist Carmen Boeing of GPL, Boning, sorry, which both documented and explained the significant drop in sea level. We all hear that sea levels are rising but at that year in 2011, there was a drop. So they looked at what caused it. The study showed that water that left the ocean causing the drop in sea level was rained out over Australia and South America and Asia. The finding gave scientists a new view of the global water cycle. It turns out that South America and Australia worked as a huge retention basin. It took longer for the water that was raining over those areas to get back to the sea. Let me go to another, um, another tool. And this one, the, the previous one was a collaboration of NASA and, and, uh, and uh, the Germany. Um, this one here is MAP, uh, which is the soil moisture active passive Active passive comes from the types of radars that, uh, that were on board this, uh, this mission. And uh, basically it's a mission that uh, Canada is participating uh, on the science side and uh, especially agriculture and agri-food Canada uh, scientists are also working on, the, on this, uh, on data that is coming from this tool that we have orbiting the earth. The topsoil layer is of course one uh, in which the food we eat grows and where other vegetation li lives. Moisture in the soil indirectly affects us in a variety of ways. In the course of its observation, SMAP also determines if the ground is frozen or thawed in colder areas of the world. SMAP is designed to measure soil moisture every two to three days. This permits changes around the world to be observed over time scales ranging from major storms to repeated measurements of changes over the season. The next tool I wanna to talk about is the surface water and ocean topography. This mission uh, is scheduled for launch in about a year. It's led by NASA and the Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales that's the French Space Agency, with collaborations from Canada and the United Kingdom. SWAT will survey 90% of the Earth's surface water, observe the fine details of the ocean surface topography, and measure how lakes, rivers, reservoir, and oceans are changing over time. Now, I'm gonna use a short video that gives you an explanation of what SWAT is doing. Let me, so where there's water, there is SWAT.
Thank you to NASA for this uh, beautiful video that's explaining the, this, this uh, great contribution, great collaboration to look at uh, surface water and ocean topography. Um, did you know that uh, Canada, in, in Canada, we can talk about more than 2 million lakes. So that's above 7% of our country that is covered in water. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm touching a lot on the water aspect with the, these different tools, uh, but we know they're a crucial uh, component to, uh, to agriculture and to basically life uh, here on earth. Um, so all these, um, all these satellites collect data. They're collection tools. So what do we do with the data? We transform it into, uh, and I say, when I say we, it's a general we. The Canadian Space Agency ensures that uh, you know, we, we can contribute to these, uh, these satellite systems, observation systems. Uh, but other departments are uh, transforming. And here uh, you have uh, Agriculture Canada's contribution uh, in transforming some of the data that is collected from GRACE uh, from other uh, soil moisture and, uh, and water measurements. It's a combination of space and um, uh, in situ data, so ground measurements as well. Um, space cannot do the job alone. Uh, it does give a global uh, point of view and a vantage point that is unequaled. Um, but we need to transform all these data into inform information, which we call applications. So for this part of the presentation, I just want to give you a couple of examples of the use of different sources of data that combines to provide information products. The first that you have on the screen here comes from a drought monitoring tool. Uh, you can actually go to their web page and determine, and maybe you've already done that uh, in, in your interests. Um, and you basically determine the area you're interested in, and the tool provides you with a drought risk map. Here you have North America. You could uh, focus on, on Canada it's, uh, alone, or even on uh, uh, an area in, uh, in, in one province. I illustrated the Canadian uh, map just uh, on the top right, just for, uh, for information. And then again, here, the deeper red, uh, the more uh, risk you have, uh, the, uh, uh, it's basically a higher risk of drought. Now, here's a little animation. So on the screen, you see that uh, this animation uses space data as well as observations on the ground and modeling tools to project ourselves in the future. You see the colors changing. Again, red is below what is the reference point of, uh, that was used for, for this. And green is an increase from where, uh, from that reference point. So this particular map is about corn and the subtle change in color indicate, um, are indicating uh, increasing or decreasing production per the years. And you see that the, uh, the outlook uh, does, not, does not look good for corn. That's because of weather changes, uh, water. And so it's a combination of many sources of data. As I said, green highlights areas where there would be an increase or red to indicate a decrease. And those maps have been developed for uh, a few crops. Um, they, um, you will see in a, a later animation that I have, you, you will see those mentioned uh, very briefly. Uh, there's one on wheat uh, that I saw that uh, basically has, um, has positive outlook, uh, showing a small increase uh, in, the, in the next, uh, in the next while, so until 2050. Um, but uh, corn definitely uh, had the advantage of showing you uh, dr more drastic change on a small screen. So time for another video, like I said, that puts everything together. It's gonna talk about uh, how data 
and different factors are brought in in order to, uh, to derive information from those observations. Oops, that didn't go well. So, so Eric, just just want to jump in real quick. There was no audio on that. Um, oh, sorry. The last two, so seems to be a bit of an issue with audio. So if you can just maybe just do it, just uh, explain what's happening in these uh, these videos for the the rest of them. If that's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, well, that video basically. Um, do you want do you want me to run it again and uh, talk over, or um, I can do that. We got about 15 minutes, yeah? So go ahead, yeah. Go to previous and you can walk, talk about it. And then that'll be probably better. Okay. So uh, something probably, uh, something I didn't do when sharing. So basically what you're saying, what you're seeing here is different um, views and different uh, impact of climate change. So of course, talking about uh, wildfires and, um, and floods. What you see uh, there is the global increase of temperature that is having an, an impact. And corn, like I mentioned, corn, wheat, different, um, different crops are basically impacted by those climate change data. So like I said, they're, they're basically showing projections and using supercomputer models, they are projecting future uh, climate models and basically extrapolating the different data and inputting this into uh, growing conditions. So overall, they, de they did it with uh, rice, corn, soya beans, uh, uh, and wheat. And corn and wheat show the more uh, marked changes. And basically, raising temperature on this um, raising temperature on uh, on corn and on on the earth for corn will put stress on the plants and stress will basically go and decrease the yield as much as 24 percent by 2069 uh, then the, 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 the video talks also about wheat, which has a different uh, approach because it's grown in more temperate regions. 
And basically the increase in carbon dioxide could have a, a positive impact. It could increase it up to 17%, but it would level off in 2050, according to the models. The rest of the video is about uh, the fact that changing conditions will affect agriculture. And therefore, the more we understand the changing of the climate, the changing of the different uh, parameters, the better prepared we will be in order to face this. I apologize for not uh, for this uh, not having played uh, with uh, sound. Okay, so um, I want to take uh, uh, a, a few minutes to to make the link even clearer between rocket science and um, and, and agriculture. Um, Basically, I, I did mention the reciprocal relationship between rocket science and agriculture, uh, but uh, since my last few slides will touch on that, I, here you see a picture of David St. Jacques checking up on lettuce in the International Space Station. On the top right, it's a picture of Mars. You can imagine that if we want to send people to Mars, we are going to need food. The trip to Mars is nine months, and Mars gets close enough to be considered a destination about every two years. So we would like to benefit from the development of food production technologies in harsh environments to sustain astronauts on their future voyage. We launched the deep spood, the, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up the uh, space to spoon uh, 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 event and the Deep Space Food Challenge. We launched a Deep Space Food Challenge a while back, and uh, Phase One is basically now we've we've had uh, we've announced the winners. Uh, this is a prize challenge co-organized co by NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Privy Council Office Impact and in on Innovation Unit. Uh, it's uh, under the Impact Canada Initiative. The focus is on technologies benefiting food production for long duration space missions, but that can have direct benefit to terrestrial systems. The 10 winners of phase one are a mix of plant production system, insect production systems, microalgae production systems. The deep space food challenge seeks to create novel food production technologies that require minimal inputs, materials, energy, water, et cetera, and maximize safe, nutritious, and palatable food. These innovations will not only be used for long duration space missions, but will also have the potential to benefit people on earth, particularly in remote and a harsh environment, such as Canada's North. And talking about Canada's North, uh, this is, there's no sound on this one, so I'll be talking over. So what you see here is the images uh, from the Narvik project in Joaven in, in the north of Canada. So I did mention that astronauts traveling to other planets will be facing harsh environments in which they will have to produce food. Bringing everything from Earth is not a viable option because of the volume and weight involved. So when we look at how we test this, how we put it in the right conditions, this is, uh, these, are, these images come from uh, the project, uh, the Narvik Initiative, or in, it basically translates into growing place. This is a joint effort with the community of Joaven. Arctic Research Foundation, for which uh, we ha I have to thank for the, the video, uh, National Research Council, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and the Canadian Space Agency. Renewable energy plant production system that can also serve as a test bed for food production technologies that may one day fly in space. This is the purpose of this installation. So when we're using this pool, uh, of space technology in our thinking, 
We can also benefit from terrestrial food production system for space. Imagine this northern and remote food production systems where power may be limited and where there is a desire to produce as much food as possible without producing significant amount of waste. Safe food production systems are also obviously required if we're thinking about keeping our astronauts healthy for long duration future space missions. The same is critical in northern and remote communities. We also have other activities. Uh, we do have a food production topical team composed of experts across Canada to provide recommendations to the Canadian Space Agency on priorities and future activities. And uh, we are interested in investigating small scale lunar plant production payloads, as well as possible major Canadian infrastructure contribution to the lunar surface. Uh, that is through the Lunar Surface Exploration Initiative. Let me just uh, give you a reminder that our vision for Canada is to ensure space data serves Canadians and the world to support global and national challenges. Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has got a living lab network where we are working in the field to bring together farmers, scientists, and other collaborators to the co-development and test innovative practices and technologies to address agri-environmental issues. This is one network. Um, I know last year I talked about get in touch with us, let us know your needs. Um, it doesn't seem to be as evident as I would like it to be, uh, but uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada do have a few networks that they are working. And the Canadian Space Agency, along with federal partners, is working on a process that would allow for the identification of needs by different user communities uh, in order to take these into consideration when we develop new tools to address our challenges. I hope this uh, presentation has shown you that while agriculture dates back a long time with humanity and rocket science is fairly new in humanity's history, that the two go hand in hand in assuring our future. With this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, merci, Miigwech, thank you. Back to you, Andrew. Perfect, thanks, Eric. That was uh, certainly enlightening. Uh, learned a lot about uh, what the Canadian Space Agency is doing. So really appreciate that, um, that presentation. If anyone has any questions, you can type it into the, uh, the chat. Um, and then I'll be answering those uh, and Eric, or I'll be asking those and then Eric can answer them. So feel free to do that. Um, I'll make sure that I'm not missing out on anything, but I haven't seen any come through yet. Um, so interesting, you, oh, I'll have a quick question for you, Eric. You were talking about uh, growing, um, potentially growing on, on Mars. So when you're looking at uh, nine month flight time, um, obviously you have to carry a fair amount of food for that alone. And then you're, and you said it was available, you can, it's only close enough every two years. So we're talking about um, 40 months of a commitment for someone if they just did one tour basically. So you have to, you would have to be producing a fair amount of food once you got there as well. Um, you're at the point of lettuce. What, what other sustainable food will need to be there to, to make it um, a viable option to grow? Well, that's, uh, that's exactly what the deep uh, space food um, uh, project or challenge is about is about looking at what can be produced, what, uh, what do we need in order to, uh, to sustain life uh, and human presence. Uh, and we're talking about Mars because it's a long duration flight. There's other technological challenges right now uh, for, for Mars, for sure. You'd have to uh, pre-position a lot of the equipment uh, and that means uh, quite a few flights. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big, uh, it's a big project, it's a big uh, trip for humanity. Uh, so what we see is that 
a lot of those technologies, a lot of this will be tested with uh, with respect to the moon uh, and the gateway uh, the, the gateway initiative. Uh, but as far as um, as the types of food, um, you know, I'm I'm definitely not an expert to to answer that question. But we we are working with experts to define uh, you know what what kind uh, of food can be produced. Uh, and ensure sustainability of, uh, of human presence. Well, that's great. Um, so a question here, um, you show the changing climate model and yields. Did the NASA model also take into account the water um, or the moisture that's in the soil as well? Yes, the, as far as I can tell, the, uh, the, um, uh, the animations that I've shown uh, basically are a combination of a number of data sources. So looking at uh, now looking at underground water, looking at surface water, uh, soil moisture, and, uh, and basically that, you know, all the water cycle, the water management, uh, climate change, so uh, increasing uh, temperature. So it's, it basically illustrates how uh, data from different sources come into play to um, to feed into a model. Uh, the model is certainly not perfect uh, because we, we all we're always refining, um, but it gives a projection right now. No, yeah, that's great. Um, and do you know if the, the data being collected by the satellites is being made available as uh, open source data by companies to want to do research? Uh, I know we talked about this last year, so, but I'll let you uh, to answer that. Yeah, the, the, I would say the majority of the science missions uh, are, are, are worked to be open and free. Um, collectively, uh, I mentioned CIOS as a, as a group, an international group. Uh, we continuously uh, discuss and, uh, and promote the open science, open data. And in fact, uh, from now on, even uh, NASA to, to be able to um, collaborate with NASA on a project, uh, we have to ensure that we have the same policy on making sure that data is available and, and where in the past we kept it, uh, there, there was a time delay to allow for the uh, initial scientists to publish. Uh, there is a big push for all the data to be available as soon as it is, um, is collected so that around the globe, scientists, industry, academia can use it, uh, governments can use it. Uh, so, it. So that's definitely the type. There are some that are not uh, available, but that becomes a question of, of, um, uh, of security and, uh, and there are some, uh, some restrictions to sharing. There are also uh, commercial data more and more, and that commercial data therefore follows a different rule. Of course, it wouldn't be commercial if you didn't have to buy it. Uh, and, um, and that's, you know, that's the, the, the ecosystem in a nutshell of the data. But we do aim at making this available. And uh, you can go on the CIOS website. There's a, there's a, a global stock take uh, data portal. Um, you can go onto NASA. You can go onto GEO. Uh, site. Uh, somebody mentioned in the chat, uh, you know, are the videos available? If you search for SWAT mission on, uh, uh, on the NASA website, uh, you will get to, uh, to the video uh, I used for SWAT that wasn't, uh, didn't have any sound. And, um, and those, those videos are available uh, publicly.